Item of business is consideration of business motion 10172 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a timetable for the gender representation on Public Board Scotland Bill at stage three. I would ask anyone, anyone who wishes to speak against this uh, motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10172. Moved. Thank you. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 10172 is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We turn now to topical questions. And we start with question number one from Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported allegations of government interference in the independence of the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I fully support the independence of the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. The PERC has made clear that there has been no interference in the publication of the audit report. I'm clear that decisions about the timing of the audit report remain with the Commissioner at all stages, and it was for her to consider whether the points raised were relevant or not. She decided it was appropriate to proceed as planned, and the Scottish Government fully supports the principle that the PERC is independent in making such decisions. There is regular dialogue between the Scottish Government sponsor teams and non-departmental public bodies. It's part of this to encourage uh, public bodies to consider their role in the wider context of public services. Daniel Jones. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I note the Minister's response, but last month, Scottish Government officials were rebuked by the PERC for interfering with its independence following a specific request from an official. So can I ask, when did the Minister become aware of this request? What steps has the Minister taken to ensure that this will not happen again? And with stories of the government meddling in the SPA and now the PERC, can the Minister guarantee that this is the last story about interference with the police that will emerge from his department? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, I became aware of the uh, emails regarding uh, this matter on the 25th of January, last Thursday, when we were advised of the PERC planning to uh, publish the FOI request. Uh, what I uh, do recognise is that the PERC believe that aspects of the email uh, from my official of the 30th of November uh, could be perceived as government interference with her independence. And I also recognise that it is important that there should be no room for ambiguity in communications. And I fully support the independence of the Police Investigation and Review uh, Commissioner. Uh, officials were setting out the aims, with the aim of the email was to identify risk for the PERC to consider. Officials were aware of a number of ongoing investigations of complaints against senior officials, uh, senior officers, uh, but had no knowledge of the content of the audit report uh, when the email was sent on the 30th of November. Uh, the PERC, I think, member, uh, the member will recognise, has made clear that there was no interference in the publication of the report. I'm clear that decisions about the timing of the report remain with the Commissioner at all stages, and it was for her to consider whether the points raised were relevant or not. And she decided it was appropriate to proceed as planned, and I fully support her independent decision-making in these matters. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I note that the Minister has twice said that there was no interference, but that rather uh, depends on, the, on the, the critical fact was that the request wasn't successful. The crucial question is whether the government attempted to interfere in independent bodies. That was the PERC's view in December, and I quote, my perception of your remarks is that governmental interference with my independence, the attempt to interfere and failing is morally no different from attempting to interfere and succeeding. Does the Minister accept that attempts to interfere in the independence of key public bodies such as the PERC is completely unacceptable? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senator Officer, let me just uh, quote the PERC on this matter, and I quote directly uh, from them. There has been no instance of government interference and the release of the document went ahead within the planned timescale. Now, I recognise, as I've already said, in terms of the perception uh, that the PERC had in relation to the officials 
uh, email in itself. And the member will recognise that government, in terms of its engagement with public bodies, will have ongoing engagement over a whole range of different issues. It, it, is, appropriate for, it is appropriate for officials in engagement with uh, bodies which they sponsor to highlight issues of risk for them to consider. What I'm very clear about is that in officials highlighting that, it's entirely for the Commissioner to determine whether they are relevant or not yep. and to make their decisions on that basis. And that's exactly yep. what happened here. And the Commissioner proceeded with the time frame that she had set out. And I fully support that and recognise that's an important part in the independence of the PERC. A number of uh, members who want to ask questions here. Liam Kerr to be followed by George Adam. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Michael Matheson can stand there and claim the report wasn't delayed and there was no interference. But it is no defence to say the government tried to stop it and failed. An attempt at interference is still interference. We now know there's a deeply embedded culture of secrecy and central interference, and that tone is set from the top. Michael Matheson should have the good grace to realise what that means, and if he doesn't, we should spell it out. He has fallen short of the standards set expected in high office. He does not have the moral credibility to do his job. When will he do the honourable thing and resign? Cabinet Secretary. General Officer, I'll continue to do the honourable thing, and that is to do my job properly. Uh, and, I, uh, and as I've, and as I've, as, as I've set out to, uh, uh, as I've set out to Mr. Johnston, uh, officials were aware that the PERC were undertaking taking an audit of the SPA's complaints process, and the PERC informed them in late November that the audit would be published in December. Officials were aware of a number of ongoing investigations into complaints against senior officers, but had no knowledge of the contents of the audit report when the email was sent on the 30th of November. They aimed to identify potential risks for the PERC to consider. And it was clear from the PERC's response on the 5th of December that the report would be published the end, end, at the end of December. It is legitimate for government to highlight potential risks that may be relevant to the work of a public body. That's not a new thing in government. That's a thing that has gone on in government for many, many years and under different administrations as well. But the decision on what action was appropriate in light of those issues was clearly a matter for the PERC to make. And the PERC, as an independent body, has made it clear that there has been no interference in this publication. And as the PERC has also stated, they decided it was appropriate to proceed as planned uh, in the publication of the report. And I fully support the independent decision making of the PERC in this matter. George Adam to be followed by John Finney, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. At this point, it's important to get the actual facts across. And can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that at no point has the Scottish Government interfered in the report being carried out by the PERC or the day of its publication? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, at no point has the Scottish Government interfered in this or any report carried out by the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner. Uh, the PERC is a, an independent body. And it's been made clear that there has been no interference by the Scottish Government in this particular publication. And the release, as I've mentioned now several times, went ahead as was planned in the timescale. Uh, the Scottish Government is clear that decisions about the timing of this audit report remain for the Commissioner at all stages. Yeah. And it was for her to consider whether the points raised by officials were relevant or not. She decided it was appropriate to proceed as planned and the Scottish Government fully supports the principle of the PERC making these independent decisions. John Finney to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can you outline how you would characterise relationships between yourself and PERC? And since you've made very clear what you consider doesn't constitute uh, political interference, could you perhaps outline some examples of what would constitute political interference, please? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, in my view is that the role of the PERC is entirely independent of government in taking forward their investigations in these matters. Clearly it is a sponsored division by the Scottish Government because we fund it in order to support it in its role and we'll provide them with support and guidance as we do with any other public body within the public sector landscape. That's not peculiar to the PERC or to justice, that happens right across government. When I was a health minister, in terms of working with uh, sponsored uh, bodies within the health sector as well, it would be the same in other parts um, of the public sector. Uh, and that support and guidance is a key part of government and its relationships with 
uh, with the public bodies. But it's also equally important to recognise the independent nature of these bodies. Uh, and in decisions relating to these types of matters, it's entirely a matter for the PERC to make determinations on these matters and to consider whether any views that are expressed by the government are relevant or not, and to then take a decision on what action they will take. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. A government official suggesting PERC uh, hold back a report because the timing wasn't convenient is extremely serious. And even if the interference was unsuccessful, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that this shows the unhealthy consequences of concentrating power in the hands of so few and that the temptation to intervene would be less were power shared more widely? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so also the issue in relation to the time of the publication of the report was for the PERC. What I can say is that at the time when the email was sent uh, to the PERC by uh, the official within the Scottish Government, uh, they had no knowledge of the content of the report or the terms of reference of the report in terms of the, the timescale of the complaints that it was dealing with. Uh, that only became, the detail of that only became uh, known to the Scottish Government when the embargoed copy of it was uh, provided. So I think it's wrong to try and suggest that this was about uh, because of our critical aspects within the report that the government uh, just didn't think was convenient because it didn't know what was in the report uh, in the first place. So it is important that the PERC are able to take forward these matters in a time frame that is appropriate to them. And I know that members have raised concerns in the past about the time it takes for the PERC to investigate certain complaints and certain uh, issues, but the reality is that that's entirely a matter for the PERC. Um, if it takes longer for the investigation to be thorough and detailed, then it's entirely appropriate that they should be given the time and the space, and we should recognise that in order to allow a very thorough and detailed investigation to be undertaken in any complaints that they are dealing with. And I'll continue to defend them in making sure that they are given uh, the right to be independent in these matters and the appropriate time to investigate complaints as and when it's appropriate. Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Perk is the, the latest example of the, can, the Cabinet Secretary interfering in um, the decisions of a public body. On the 24th of January, I asked the Minister very specifically whether he sought legal advice before interfering in the SBA decision. His response was that he took appropriate advice from members. So I asked him, which members did he seek advice from? Specifically, was the First Minister one of these members? What advice was given? And this is the fourth opportunity the Cabinet Secretary has had to come to the Chamber to tell us whether or not, categorically, he sought legal advice. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, 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 in relation to the PERC report, there was no legal advice for me to take because uh, it was an issue in terms of an email exchange between, uh, between officials. In relation to the wider point she's made, uh, uh, government officials and I take advice from uh, officials on an ongoing basis in a whole range of matters, and part of that includes taking uh, legal advice. But I'm sure the member will also recognise is that governments don't publish the details of the na and the nature of the legal advice which you receive, which is not just the position of this government, but has been a position of previous governments and is the same position as the UK government in these matters. So I have taken advice from appropriate officials, including legal advice, <coughs> as and when it's necessary, on a whole range of matters relating to my portfolio. Rona Mackay to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. For the avoidance of doubt, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when he first became aware that the PERC was undertaking an audit of SPA complaints and when he first saw the report? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Presiding Officer, I became, first became aware of the audit that was being undertaken by the PERC when they uh, published the, uh, uh, the details of that at the end of June of this year uh, and received an embargoed copy of the uh, PERC report on the 27th of December. Mary Fee to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Given that the independence of the PERC is set out in law, has the Cabinet Secretary examined whether there have been any breaches of the Civil Service Code in relation to this incident? And if not, will he do so? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, matters in relation to breaches of the Civil Service Code are a matter for the Civil Service. Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Um, to follow up on that, however, um, surely by t failing to take records of crucial meetings, uh, Michael Masson and his officials may have breached the Ministerial and Civil Service Code, and uh, surely the right thing to do is take responsibility and resign. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I didn't have any meetings with regards to this particular report that the members referred to. Uh, Fulton McGregor to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President. Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary, are PERC properly resourced to deal with the current ongoing investigations? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, President Officer, the uh, PERC are taking forward, obviously, a, a significant level of work and demand that's been placed upon them because of the uh, range of complaints which they are now dealing with. Uh, since uh, the PERC were, uh, were created back in 2013, uh, we have increased the budget of the PERC by some 20%. Uh, and this year alone, I provided the PERC with an additional £100,000 uh, 100, to deal with the additional demands which they are facing. I've also uh, received at the end of last year a business plan, a business uh, 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 plan by the, uh, put together by the PERC uh, in regard to the increasing demand which they are facing uh, and the resources which are necessary in order to meet that demand. And I've given uh, consideration to that. And with the uh, support of Parliament around the budget, um, if it's agreed, uh, I intend to increase the PERC's budget by over a million pounds in the forthcoming financial year which will increase their budget by almost 30% in order to allow them uh, to increase the range of uh, staff that they have in dealing with the investigations and the demands which they are experiencing at the present time. Maurice Corey to be followed by Neil Finnegan. <coughs> Presiding officer, uh, meddling in the decision making of independent bodies cannot be tolerated. The public will be most appalled at the sustained cover-up which appears to be sanctioned from the very top. How does Michael Matheson expect to continue day-to-day -day working with those who have accused him of governmental interference with their independence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so I, know, sir, I have absolutely no idea what cover-up the member is trying to make reference to, but what I will do is I will quote what the PERC have got to say in this matter, and that is that there has been no instance of government interference and the release of the document went ahead within the planned timescale. The emails that the member uh, and others have made reference to were brought to my attention on Thursday the 25th of January for the first time. Did I have knowledge of the engagement between my official and the perks? No, I had no knowledge. Did I ask them to make so a uh, representation? No, I did not. Uh, so I hope that clarifies things for the member in terms of my involvement in the matter. Neil Findlay, to be followed finally by Mike Rumbles. I understand why the Minister will be confused because there's so many covers up, cover ups, he doesn't know which one we're talking about. But on a related, <coughs> on a related issue, in November, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary said, delivered uh, their report on the undercover policing in Scotland to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, why is this report still not being published? And is this another one? where the, the Minister is deciding when it will be released. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary. I do know, sir. Um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the report will be published in, in due course. And finally, Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Is it the case that the Cabinet Secretary fails to recognise attempted interference in the independence of independent bodies? Is it because he's failing to recognise that he and his officials are interfering in that way, is that because he himself or his officials routinely communicate like this to independent bodies? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, as I've made clear, is that there has always been the case that government engages with a range of non-departmental public bodies uh, on a whole range of issues across government. That's no different in this government as it was in previous governments, uh, which when the Liberal Democrat Labour Party were in control within uh, Scotland. And I've got no doubt it remains the case uh, with the UK government as well, uh, offering guidance and support and exchanging information with them. That is normal part of government's work and normal part of that engagement process. And I'm sure that the member would recognise that that's not something that's peculiar to this government. It's something which has always occurred in terms of the relationship between government and other public bodies. Thank you. That concludes our questions on uh, Perk. The second question, top of all question, is Christine Graham. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on concerns regarding the occurrence of stop skipping by ScotRail. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, I completely understand the frustration that skip stopping can have on the customer experience. I fully expect the performance issues to be addressed uh, immediately, and I speak with Alex Hines, the MD of ScotRail Alliance on a regular occasion to stress that very point in an answer to a question last week from Alex Rowley. I, I mentioned the fact that Alex Hines has instigated an independent review of part of Scott Rail's recovery measures, which I very much welcome. Uh, the review is very much underway and will look at steps to recover performance and aim to reduce skip stopping. Uh, once these findings are, uh, of this are published, I will, of course, uh, take the opportunity to look at the re recommended steps for improvement and how that information uh, is made publicly 
available. I am aware that the practice, of course, is uh, undeniably uh, and understandably uh, unpopular. Uh, therefore, it's an area that my officials at Transport Scotland will continue to monitor and challenge ScotRail on to ensure that, that practice is minimised. Just to put some context on it, the member uh, would uh, like to note, I'm sure, that over the last year, around 0.78% of services uh, ran skip stops against the circa 763,000 services that were booked. Just to put that in context, that means that 99.2% uh, of services uh, did not skip their stops. Christine Graham. With reference to the view, can the Minister advise now or after view how many of these stop skippings were due to breakdowns on the network or breakdowns of other rail providers? And given that it's not under the, all the control of ScotRail, I'm not excusing it, is there not an argument for integrating the network and ScotRail? Minister. Uh, yes, well, I mean, the member raises uh, a good point. I don't have the exact figures uh, to hand, but of course I'll look them out uh, with my officials. But from time and time again, through independent reports like Reform Think Tank, uh, they've shown that 54%, the majority of delays, are down to network rail and the infrastructure. And of course, network rail still is a reclassified body under the UK government's Department for Transport and not within the devolved control uh, of this parliament or indeed this government. But she's right, that is not an acceptable excuse at all. And simply uh, put, ScotRail and the ScotRail Alliance must work on minimising uh, skip stopping. I should say in the context, looking at uh, the last uh, railway year, there were significant improvements in terms of skip stopping. Uh, you know, we've got it down to, or ScotRail managed to get it down to 0.4% of services. Now that has increased because of the poor uh, performance in autumn and winter. And as I say, when this independent review has conducted, uh, of course, I will share the recommendations uh, uh, in an appropriate way uh, with members around this chamber. Christine Graham. Uh, I know what the Minister says about Network Rail's part in this, but as a victim of unannounced stop skipping myself on the Borders Railway, as the train whizzed past Newton Grange where my car was, I had to go on to Shawfair, take the next train south. Had I been picking up children, in a different matter from me just being very, very cross. Will the Minister see to ending this practice because the impact on individuals on the train can be quite substantial if you've got children to pick up, elderly people, job interviews and so on, they can lose 45 minutes by having to go to another station and take a train back? Minister. Uh, you know, the member's example is one that uh, is too often uh, experienced by people on the railway, as I've said, and I'm, I simply am not dismissing that concern uh, in the slightest. Uh, what I would say uh, is that in some instances, uh, the ScotRail Alliance feel that skip stopping has to take place because of the fact that because uh, the infrastructure might fail, there might be a points failure, a signal failure, there might be a rolling stock failure. Uh, therefore, in order for the entire network not to be out of kilter, uh, they might have to skip a stop. However, what is clearly unacceptable and what happens far too often is the communication around that. Uh, people are already on the train uh, and, they, and, and then their, their, their stop uh, is missed out and skipped. Now, if people knew in advance that the train was not going to stop at XYZ station, then they could perhaps plan their journeys ahead. So they're clearly a failure in communication, as well as, as I say, uh, not a uh, good enough experience uh, in terms of performance either. But I can give the member the absolute assurance that as part of the independent review being taken forward by Nick Donovan, uh, they are considering how to minimise this practice so we can get it you know, down to the, the, the absolute minimal levels. There are up to another six members wanting in on this issue, clearly of some interest. If the Minister can make his replies as brief as possible, we'll see how many we'll get through. I don't think we'll get through them all. Number one, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Around 20 trains a day in Scotland miss their stop, causing huge inconvenience to both those on the train who are unable to get off, but also those waiting at stations. Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, what conversation he is having with ScotRail to ensure that this practice is minimised? Uh, will he ensure that ScotRail give passengers more advanced foresight that a station will be skipped and better informational alternatives? And can I ask how passengers that are affected by this practice are adequately compensated for any inconvenience or cost incurred a result uh, of their stop being missed? Minister. Again, I would say to Jamie Green, I hope I answered those questions to Christine Graham, but to emphasise, uh, yes, I will, of course, uh, reiterate that point to Alex Hines. I would encourage him uh, to do so is absolutely part of the independent review. Once those recommendations come my way, I will certainly look at them and, 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 and of course, have a discussion with Jamie Green around those recommendations. But he is absolutely right 
to highlight the point around communication, which is such a frustration uh, for passengers. And in fact, I think passengers uh, that I have, have, have talked to and spoken to, they completely understand that things can go wrong on any rail network, whether it's the infrastructure, whether it's rolling stock. Uh, what they are not prepared to accept is the lack of communication in this 21st, uh, you know, 2018 and the 21st century with the smartphone technology that we have. Uh, really, that message should be getting out to them. What I would say, just to, to mention, the, the member did say there's 20 services a day. Again, just to put that into context, that is about 0.8% of services. The vast majority still do uh, run to the stations that they're meant to. But uh, notwithstanding that, the point I think the member makes are, are well made. Jackie Bailey. The Minister knows that passengers on ScotRail services to Dumbarton, Hillensburg and Balloch are frequently affected by station skipping and scheduled services often whiz past Cardras and Dumbarton Central stations without stopping, leaving passengers stranded. Even the promise to abolish station skipping during rush hour has been broken. Can I point out as gently as I can to the Minister, 0.08% may sound small, but it's 64,000 journeys, and it feels like most of them are happening in my patch. Um, will the Minister ensure that statistics are published for each line and end the practice of station skipping at key stations like Dumbarton Central and Cardras? Minister. Um, what I would say, to the, I'm not sure about the figures that she necessarily quoted, but I, I certainly haven't been dismissing them. I hope uh, in the tone of all my questions here, I've said that that practice is one uh, that clearly I find uh, unacceptable. But I did try to give you some context around why sometimes it might be necessary. So the rest of the network is not out of kilter for the rest of the day. But I agree with that. It's too high uh, as it is. When I spoke to Alex Hines, I should say he personally mentioned that he'd be uh, in continual dialogue with uh, Jackie Bailey. I think he's got another meeting arranged. If not, uh, I think uh, it should be coming uh, her way. So he personally mentioned uh, the fact that uh, he'll be speaking to Jackie Bailey, uh, and I know this will be uh, part of the agenda. What I would say is that the promise, she, she is wrong, and I just want to correct the record. It was never said that it would be abolished during peak time, it would be minimised during peak time. And that's clearly, again, not happened. And so we have to ensure uh, that we get back to, the, to, to, to minimising. And we did manage to achieve that. And Scotland did manage to achieve that earlier uh, in 2017, during the spring and the summer of 2017. Uh, but clearly, autumn and winter performance is just simply not where we want it to be. So I hope the member will understand I'm simply not dismissing at all uh, these very real frustrations by the passengers. And as soon as uh, that independent review is conducted, we can get, uh, hopefully, Scotrail back in the trajectory of improving performance. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, does the Minister accept that, given that stop skipping is scored less harshly than a late arrival, that the franchise agreement positively encourages this practice? Minister. I know I don't, because it's still counted towards a PPM failure. But his member, his colleague, I should say, Mark Ruskell, uh, made this point to me, and I said that I would reflect on that when it comes to future franchises uh, and looking to see how we can continue to disincentivise uh, this practice. But it does count as a PPM failure. I think that's very, very important. Uh, and, of course, uh, Scott Rail. Uh, are judged on their PPM uh, statistics uh, as well. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Can the Minister look into the situation in my constituency of scheduled trains ending at Hamilton and not continuing on to the halt at Lark Hall via Shatlerow in Meryton? Not quite station skipping, but just missing out the final three stations. This is an all too regular occurrence and has left many of my constituents stranded, out of pocket and incredibly upset, especially if they have annual season tickets. Minister. Yes, I will. And I'll, I'll mention that point to Alex Hines, uh, the MD of Scotland Alliance. When I speak to him, I'll encourage him to meet with uh, the member directly. But uh, she's absolutely right. I mean, it will be a source of frustration if you're expecting to stop at those last three stops. And of course, the train uh, does not. So I accept that. And, and, and as I say, I don't minimise that or dismiss that concern. Uh, but I will arrange for Alex Hines to speak to her personally uh, about this issue. And I know the member has been very, uh, had very good engagement with him on other issues around uh, uh, Hamilton Central and the, the antisocial behaviour uh, therein. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given that performance data on stop skipping, overcrowding, and even what targets ScotRail work towards are not routinely published, does the Minister not accept that it's time for both ScotRail and the Government to come clean with the travelling public and publish the statistics on stop skipping on a routine basis so we can properly assess performance? I mean, I, I don't accept the characterisation from, from Colin Smith at all. I mean, there is a, a plethora of statistics that are published very routinely. Uh, sometimes members need, uh, need uh, pointed in the right direction of where they may be, and I'll reflect on that because there can be a lot of statistics uh, there, but I will reflect on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, again, as I say, dismissing uh, his concern on that, but we are very upfront with our figures. That's why I've been able to quote him period by period figures. I can break that down by line 
uh, and by service uh, as well. So I'm more than happy to do that because we've got nothing to hide in the sense that we want ScotRail to improve, working with them uh, hand in hand to see that improvement. And hopefully when the independent report is published, I'm more than happy to, of course, uh, speak to Colin Smith in his new role. Uh, I know uh, overseeing transport issues uh, for the Labour Party on what those recommendations are. And finally, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. I have some sympathy with the issue of Scots Slipping, given that Sunnyside and Central Coat Bridge has been subject to this in recent weeks to the annoyance of many commuters. But does the Minister agree with me that the Treasury announcement last year that real funding provided for Scotland would be £600 million less than is needed over the five years from 2019 is a major factor in this and risks serious damage to rail projects, performance and infrastructure? Minister. Yes, I think it's a good point uh, to raise because clearly any shortfall in funding is going to impact the infrastructure, is going to impact uh, the maintenance uh, of the railway. So we'll continue to have that uh, dialogue uh, with the UK government. But again, I, I simply, you know, notwithstanding that, uh, there's clearly uh, an imperative here for ScotRail to imp improve the performance, which I know Alex Hines takes seriously, uh, and also to, of course, reduce uh, the, 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 uh, the practice of, of uh, skipping stops. So we'll continue to focus on that at the same time, uh, continue conversations with the UK government on what is a very damaging settlement for Scotland's railways. Thank you. And that concludes topical questions. And I would thank both ministers and all the members um, for taking all the questions. There was clearly a high level of interest and we did have some time in hand this afternoon.